Amen. Take your Bibles over to Second Timothy tonight. Second Timothy. Um, I preached Sunday evening a week and a half ago about perilous times. And uh, I want to continue not necessarily about the perilous times or the people of perilous times, but about our response to and the need that that we have to live for the Lord in this time. Your Christian testimony has never been more important than it is right now. Your witness has never been more important than it is right now. I just want you to think about the number of people passing away. I don't know, maybe you haven't heard, I don't, I don't, know, I don't watch a lot of mainstream news. In fact, I don't really watch any of that. I, but I do have certain things that I keep track of, uh, usually on a daily basis. And uh, the, the, um, there was a tour group, got in a submarine, went to take a look at the, the shipwreck, the Titanic, the real one, not the one down there at Branson. But they went down and they lost contact with the submarine. There's five people. At least five. I, I, there's probably crew members on that as well, I would imagine, but they've lost track. Had, had anybody know they found it this afternoon? They were doing some knocking yeah, the, the, the last I heard was earlier today. Still don't know where it's at. Right? Huh? Well, no doubt. Monetarily. Sure, absolutely. But just, I mean, I'm just sharing with you. I'm just what I'm saying, what I want to bring out is that there are people all around us of all walks of life, and their lives are being snuffed out for, for all kinds of reasons, right? Some of them having accidents, some of them having you know, you know health issues, some of them are going down in the deep sea to look at something for fun. You know, those people got on that thinking. We'll be back in a couple hours. They may never, they may not even be found, much less come back. Now I want you to understand something. Every one of those souls that died today, of whatever cause it was, are in eternity. And according to the record that I have, the majority of them are not where they wanted to go not where they expected to go. They got a rude awakening of the most violent kind, if you know what I mean. And that's why I say our Christian testimony. You know, I think of, I think of, all, of, the, of all of the recorded history that we have, and I think that there are some key moments in history that were absolutely critical, and the testimony of the people of that time were absolutely critical. I think of Noah. I mean, think about that. Those eight people is all that survived. But he had a testimony, and not a one of those people could stand before God and say, I didn't know. What do you mean you didn't know? Noah's been preaching a hundred years, building this great big ark in the middle of nowhere. Y'all thought he was nuts. Don't talk to me about you didn't know, right? But the reality is, now think about this today. There are people we pass by every single day that not only don't they know, we didn't tell them. Brother Aguiar preached a message while he was here that last night 
on you may be the only Bible that anybody ever reads. Right? What is that? That's testimony. That's what people can learn or see or you know, know based on looking, observing you. If you were alive in Noah's day, you had no excuse. Because Noah was a living testimony of God's grace and mercy and judgment. All of it. I think of um, Moses. You know, Daniel. I think of all these different ones through all of history that just, I think of Lot. Now, of course, that's a other side of the coin testimony, isn't it? That's not a head side, that's a tail side for sure. But he, we can say he let the Lord down. But now I want you to think about something. He didn't just let the Lord down. There are who knows how many people in a place called hell today because he did not maintain his testimony in that perilous time that he was living. Now, I just want to bring to to us tonight and, and lay out before us that we are living in one of those, I believe, critical times in history. I don't know how much future we have left. I think the Lord's coming soon. I hope he's coming soon. But let's just say that he doesn't. And in a thousand years from now, oh, I hope not. But in a thousand years from now, as, as people on this earth, I mean, let's face it, even, no matter what, there's a thousand years from now because it might be the rule of Christ, right? That would be praise God for that. I hope that's the case. But in a thousand years from now, as they look back, what are they going to say the people about the people of our time? Is it going to be, yeah, they were a lot like Lot, or they were a lot like Noah, right? Two, two opposite extremes, right? Noah and Lot, no, Moses and Lot, two opposite extremes. Uh, if you found your spot in 2 Timothy, I want you to notice chapter 3 with me, and we're going to look at it, uh, a, a section, you know, we looked at chapter 3, verse 1, as we talked uh, Sunday, uh, two, two Sundays ago. But I want you to notice another, the, the context. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, verse 1. Okay? And then we get, got into all of that from verse 2 down. Look with me at verse 10. Verse 10, let's stand together because I want to have a word of prayer with you because we're going to need God's help tonight. We need God's help tomorrow, Right? I mean, that testimony I gave a minute ago about Steve and his family and what happened to them, it just mind-boggling to them over a mailbox. And uh, anyway, verse 10. But thou hast fully known, Paul's writing, my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, notice, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men... And seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Again, the context of this passage is perilous times, verse 1. But notice what he says in verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We need to continue. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your love for us, for your mercy and grace in our lives. And tonight, as we consider our testimony in this perilous time, I pray for your boldness and your strength and your wisdom that we might live up to the times that we're living in. 
that our lives might be a light shining bright, that we might make a difference, that we might at least take away people's excuses as they examine, as they look at, as they witness our lives. They might not be able to say, well, I never knew. I had never any way of knowing. Just by their knowing us, they would have known better. Help us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In thinking about our testimony, I want, to, I want to present three thoughts to you tonight. Our testimony, according to this passage, should be a, cons, a, a contrasting testimony. All right? A contrast. You know what contrast is, right? Light versus dark, right? So, you know... It, if I was wearing a white shirt, I might blend into or an off-white colored shirt. I might blend into this. But because I'm wearing a blue shirt, there's contrast. You can see me moving around, right? Uh, us, those of us that go to the woods and hunt deer, we often get in our camouflage. Why? So there's no contrast between us and the tree, right? Black and white contrast. When you change the contrast on your monitor, on your TV, uh, it makes the image crisper and, and easier to see and less straining on the eyes. That's what contrast is. Our testimony should be contrast. So what, what do you mean by contrast in the way of our testimony? Notice what he said in verses 10 and 11. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came on me at Iconium, at Antioch, rather, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. I want you to notice that Paul contrasted his life not only with the people around him. I believe his life was a contrast if you compared him to anybody around, but I... But also noticed and thought about this. Paul's life was a contrast before and after his salvation. He was a completely different man after he got saved than he was before. Who he hung around with changed. How he handled himself changed. How he talked changed. Everything about Paul changed when he got saved. His life was, was a contrast of before and after. Not only that, it was a contrast of who he was versus who other people were around him. He said, you know, you know fully my doctrine, right? My, uh, my purpose, my manner of life, my faith, my charity, my patience, my persecution, my affliction. You know, you, know, you see my life and what I am enduring in my life. Now I want you to notice that that's, this isn't the only time Paul pointed that out. I find at least two other times in Acts chapter 20 and verse 18, he writes this, and when they were come to him, uh, he said unto them, ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. He said, you you saw how I was conducting myself. You saw my, the manner in which I conducted myself. Then again in 1 Thessalonians, he wrote, chapter 1, verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. He said, you could see the difference in our life. Now, I'm thinking about Paul bringing this up. You, saw, you, you know how I live. You, you, you know what I believe. You know what I do. You know what I have to endure. You know. And I thought, you know, why is he pointing out his testimony? Why is he pointing out the difference, the contrast in his life before and after? Not only that but how he's living compared to how others are living around him. Why is he pointing this out? Is he stuck on himself? Is he proud? Was he bragging? Absolutely not. I don't believe he was. If anything, he was bragging on what Jesus did in and through his life. 
You know, there, there are those that would say today, you know, I, I occasionally give my testimony and, and tell about how um, different things transpired in my life. I want you to know that from my heart, I'm not bragging when I tell you that stuff. I'm telling you that so you know it's real. I'm telling you that not, hey, look at me, look what I did, but look what Jesus did in me. If there's anything good about me now, I'm telling you right now, it's Jesus that did it, not me. I'm thinking about Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11, and I've quoted this recently. Even in show, a child is known by his doings, the Bible says. Right? Whether his work be pure and whether it be right. What, what's that saying? It's saying if you look at a child, you know whether he's a good child or a bad child. Right? You know what kind of child he is by how they behave. Right? You know, and what is, what is how they behave? What is that? That's testimony. That's testimony. That is how we behave and how we can be seen and how others visualize us. I'm thinking about a passage in Matthew chapter 7. If you want to follow me, that'd be great. I'm going to, I'm going to read about five verses there. In Matthew chapter 7, I want to notice uh, verse 15 through 20. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Notice what he says here, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, writing about some perilous times, he says, Beware of false prophets, which come at you in sheep's clothing. I'm in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Notice they've dressed up. Notice that they're false prophets, and they've dressed up and pretending to be sheep. But Jesus reveals their inner man, their ravening wolves. But notice what he says in verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. In other words, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. It won't be long before you can't disguise, by the way, you can't disguise your actions very well. You might be able to straighten up for a little while, but it won't be long and, and, and they'll be known, right? Right? Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Never seen a fig tree with, this, with uh, thistles on it, with, with thorns on it. Never seen any thorn, uh, thorn uh, grapevines. Verse 17, even so, it says, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. What is that? That's testimony. I got to just look at their testimony, he says. And listen, again, let's go back to the opening thought, the opening question. What is our testimony? When people look at me, when people look at you, what do they see? How is your life contrasted in this world today? Right? Now listen, we're living in a perilous time, right? I mean, we, and, and there, was, there was news today of some major denominations in, in Christianity. They're just kind of going along with the whole transgender thing. They don't see any biblical problem with it, even though it's black and white. But the point is, by their fruit, you shall know them. And we hear uh, on the news, we, we read about it on the news all the time, of all these different people, spiritual people supposedly, religious people presumably, but they don't even believe what God said. 
They're not living according to what God said. By their fruit, he said, ye shall know them. They're hypocrites. They're liars. They have sheep clothing on, but inwardly, he said, they're ravening wolves. Hebrews chapter 11, let me call your attention to that thought. In Hebrews chapter 11, what's commonly referred to is the hall of faith. I mean, we read about Moses and Noah and, and all the different ones there. In chapter 5, 11, verse number 5, we're told about Enoch. You know, it's called the hall of faith. It's referred to as the hall of faith all down through chapter 11 and all the different ones that it talks about uh, and their faith and what their faith did and how their faith was evidenced. But you know what? We could call this the hall of testimonies because it's really the same thing. How did they behave? Because of what they believed about God, how did they change their conduct? How was their faith visible to the people that lived around them? And how is it visible to us today as we read Hebrews chapter 11? What do we read about Enoch? We know so very little, and, and uh, Brother Dale brought uh, Enoch up uh, this week as well. But it says in verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. He just disappeared. I wonder if they beamed him up. I think... I think that's probably where, where uh, Star Trek folks got that thought. I think that's probably where they found their inspiration. God translated him, it says. But why? How? It says, for before his translation, he had this what? Testimony. Everybody who knew Enoch knew he had this testimony. Everybody that laid eyes on him knew he had this testimony. And as God looked down from heaven, God knew he had this testimony that he pleased God. What a testimony. You know, what if we had that testimony? I, I, I sometimes think it's a shame that there's only been one translation from earth to heaven, in all of history. Now, we, we, we did see Elijah go up and all that. That's sure. But this was just different. He just vanished. Elisha watched Elijah go. He knew how he went. We got a record of that deal. But all we know about Enoch is he disappeared. wonder what his kids thought. What about his wife? I wonder what his brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles thought. I wonder what all the people in town said. Well, he pleased God. That's what they said. We all, every one of us have a testimony, and it reveals to the world around us, but also to us. We know our testimony. We know who we are, and that's what testimony does. It reveals who you really are. Not who you're pretending to be. Not who you'd like to be. But your testimony is, is written, and it's, it's known who you really are. So the question then becomes, what does our testimony tell others about us? And I know, I know, I know, I know, I get it. Somebody's going to say it. Somebody's probably thinking it. Preacher, you can't judge a book. I think God has a different story than that. I think God has a different idea than that. I mean, consider, just consider a book for a moment. What kind of cover does a romance novel have? Somebody give me a witness. So, I, I mean, did, 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 I, did I just prove my point or not? And I don't care if it's so-called Christian romance or world romance. They all have the same kind of cover on them. Okay. 
Listen, all you got to do is walk past the checkout aisle at Walmart. They still do have a magazine rack in some places, and you know which ones you shouldn't be looking at because of the cover. The cover of a book is supposed to give you a picture of what's in the book. So that's nonsense. You can't judge a book by its cover. Hey, listen, contrast those, Christian, uh, those romance novels with this cover. Holy Bible. You know what's in there, right? It's separated. It's a separated book. It's different than anything else you're going to read in the world, Right? What does your cover tell people about what's inside? Our testimony should be contrasted by the world. You put me next to the world, and there ought to be a huge difference. You put me next to the old me, and there ought to be a huge difference. Right? My Christian testimony ought to be self-evident. Let me give you another thought about our testimony. Not only should it be a contrast, it also should be Christ-like. Look at verse number 12 in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and notice what it says. He says, yea, and all. See that little word? Just three little letters and Two of them are the same. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Does your testimony tell of Jesus? You know, there's been a number of cases brought before the courts and now before the Supreme Court, of Christians who stood up and said, I don't want to bake a cake for that. I don't want to take pictures of that. I don't want to have to get involved with that. Are you with me? By the way, those people spent thousands of dollars. Their reputation was put on national television and they were drugged through the mud for their testimony's sake, for what they were going to stand up for. And I can't speak to every last one of them, but I can say this. They were willing to stand up and say, no, no, no. Because of my Jesus, I can't do that. Now, you've heard me say before... Um, we ought to be just like Jesus. In other words, when we're dealing with people who differ with us in their doctrine and way of life and all of those things, we, we're still supposed to be like Jesus. And how was Jesus? He was loving and he was kind and he was forgiving. He was compassionate and he was long-suffering. By the way, he's still all of those things. So there's a lot of Christian supposed people out there that are mean and bitter and angry and resentful and ugly. Well, guess what? Their testimony, that's what it is. And that's not a Christ like testimony either. You know, we can stand up for Christ. We don't have to be ugly about it, we don't have to get mean and bitter and resentful and hateful about it. But we should have a Christ like testimony. And people ought to be able to look at our lives and tell whether we're a follower of Jesus or not. We shouldn't have to even say a word. If they watched us for even a few minutes, they ought to be able to know they're probably a follower of Jesus. They, if they heard us speak and maybe not even directly to them, they ought to just by a sentence that they hear from our lips ought to know, they're probably a Christian. They're probably a follower of that Jesus, right? 
I'm reminded of, of Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2, 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now think about what that said. Salvation teaches us that we ought to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what salvation teaches us. Verse 13 continues, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Salvation teaches us that we ought to deny ungodliness. Not going to be a part of that. No, I don't want that. No, thank you. I don't want to, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to be involved in it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. It teaches us, salvation teaches us that we ought to live soberly. And, and soberly is even keeled, even tempered, and, and, and evenly distributed. And listen, I don't need to drown myself in alcohol or drugs. It teaches us that we ought to live righteously. Where do we learn what's righteous if it's not in the Bible? The Bible tells us what's right. God tells us what's right. Man hasn't figured out what's right. They all have a different idea of what's right. That's why it says in the Old Testament they all did that what's right in their own eyes. And it was a perilous time. And that's why we're living in a perilous time now because we've all forsaken what right living is and we've all made it up in our own minds what we think is right. Well, I just don't believe that, preacher. I think I, I, you know, this is what I believe is right. Well, okay. But you ought to compare what you think is right to what God says is right, and then you'll know whether you're right or not. It also says it teaches, salvation teaches us to live godly. Hmm. And then notice the end of that sentence. In this pre evil, present evil world. In this present evil evil. You know, we're living in perilous times, but that shouldn't change our Christ-like behavior and our Christ-like testimony. The fact that the ungodlessness abounds and surrounds us does not excuse us from having a Christ-like testimony. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we're warned, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, it says. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Now think about what that verse talks about, what it says. Now look around. This great big television hanging on the wall that we use for a monitor. This sheetrock, this wood trim, these windows, these shears, this pulpit, this uh, notebook that I'm preaching out of, that Bible that I have... These chairs you're sitting on, these flowers, everything you see, the Bible says, is going to dissolve. Your bank account and the register that records it is going to dissolve. The vault that holds all those dollars and all that gold and all that silver is going to just dissolve. The God that put all that stuff together, guess what? He's going to take it all apart. It's going to melt in fervent heat, it says in the book of Revelation. It's all just going to go away. And all you're going to be left with is your testimony. It's all you're going to have. For the rest, for the, listen, for the rest of eternity... All you're going to have is your testimony, what you were known for.
in verse 12 and 13 in that passage, looking for the looking for and hastening unto the coming of, of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on a fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the, his promise, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Oh yeah, I can't wait for that. Well, you realize everything that you have physically, everything you know as a human being is going to be gone. And all you're going to start with is your testimony. Wow. I'm thinking of 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Remember what he said to the rich young ruler? Go sell everything you have and come follow me. Uh, I, don't, I, I can't do that. And he went away sad, the Bible says. Why? Because he was attached to the physical world that he was surrounded by. I'm thinking of a time in Numbers chapter 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up about uh, the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Those men had stood up against Moses and, uh, and, and Aaron and, and God. And those, those men were, were opponents of, who do you think you are? Moses didn't think he was anybody. He was one of the most humble men, according to God's testimony. He was one of the most humble men that ever walked the face of the planet. I imagine second at least to the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe it was just second and maybe not third, but whatever the case, these were proud men. Now i got a question. If God was to talk to me tonight and tell me, the person that you're sitting next to right now, in the next 24 hours, is going to be zapped by a lightning bolt... There's no way around it. The person you're next to right now is going to get hit by lightning. And how close would you stay to them for the next 24 hours? Would you not love them from afar? <laughs> right? You, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, in this passage in Numbers, the Lord just told Moses, hey, y'all need to get away from them. You, get back get back. And in the next passage from verse 28 to 32, and Moses said, hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. And if these men die a common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, they, and they go down quick into the pit. Then ye shall understand that these men provoked the Lord. Now, if you've read the Bible, you already know this story. He no sooner finished speaking, and the earth opened up, and they and their tents and their families and everything that they had, and the earth closed up like it was a mouth. They have a testimony for the rest of eternity. They'll never get rid of it. They'll never lose it. They can never change it. It's permanent. The permanent record. And it's not Christ-like. I'm saying our testimony ought to contrast who we were, and our testimony ought to contrast who we're around, as far as the world is concerned. Not only that, our testimony should be Christ-like. And the third point that I want to give you tonight, look at verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14, But continue thou 
in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Let me tell you the third point that I want to make to you tonight and point out from this passage is that our testimony should be continuing. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. You know, you can start the Christian life, <laughs> but that's not the same as finishing it. It takes time to build your testimony. For good or evil, by the way, it'll take time to build your testimony. First time you meet somebody, you kind of get an idea of what they're like. The second time it builds on that and you think, mm, okay, that's confirming some things that I saw the first time. By the time they've been around you three or four times, you pretty much know their testimony and who and how they are, right? Is your testimony continuing? Is it consistent? In Second Timoth or Titus rather, chapter two, verse thirteen, I read this earlier. It said, "Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ." Now, listen, we're anticipating Jesus coming again. We talk about it all the time. I preach about it. The Bible explains it to us, and we don't know the time. We don't know the hour. We just know He said He's doing it. He's coming in the twinkling of an eye, as a thief in the night. No man knows the day nor the hour. It's just in the Father's hands. When he says, all right, son, go back and get your bride, here he comes, and we'll be gone. We're looking for that. It's called a blessed hope. And we hope it's soon. But let me ask you this. How do you want to be found? If Jesus isn't going to announce his coming, what might he find us doing? We've got to continue this Christian testimony. I'm not just talking about for an hour or two. I'm talking about for the rest of our lives. Because when he appears, this, there are things I don't want him to find me doing. Anybody with me? There are things, I, there are places I don't want him to have to fetch me from. Are you, are you with me? I don't, I don't want him finding me lounging around reading a romance novel. Hello. <laughs> I just wonder if y'all are sleeping. Jesus is coming again, and our testimony needs to continue until he comes. We need to be steadfast unto the end when, when he comes to get us. I'm thinking of Elijah and Elisha. As, as, as those two men were traveling around, they got to the prophets in different locations. Hey, psst, do you know that your master? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, I know it, I know it. And every time he'd say, hey, you stay here and I'll be back. No, 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 I'm, not, I'm going right with you. I am not, you're not getting out of my sight. And at one point they stopped and said, okay, what can I, I all right, let's face it, we're, I'm leaving. What would you like when I'm gone? I want a double portion of what's on you. Well, I don't know about that. And then that's, if you see me go, you'll get it, and if not, you won't. He said, I ain't taking my eyes off you, dude. The only thing that could separate those two men was the chariot and the horses of the Lord. Now listen, our testimony is important. And we got to live it until the last breath. Because we just don't know when our Lord's going to come for us. And I want him to find me being faithful. I want him to find me. You know, if he could find me right here, I'd be just happy as I could be. That'd just be awesome. 
But the reality is I don't know when he's going to come and I don't know where he's going to find me. That means I have to be on guard because we're living in perilous times. In Hebrews chapter 3, in fact, I want you to look at this. We're, gonna, we're, we're, we're near finished here. But this verse, I think, is, is an encouraging, helpful verse to, to close or bring us at least to a close in the message. Hebrews chapter 3, I want you to notice verse 12, 13, and 14 here. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> He says, take heed, brethren, pay attention, listen up, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Oh, no, preacher, I'd never do that. There have been others that have told me the same. Not only that, I know some preachers that just shocked me. There's preachers, there's preachers I know that are in prison right now. What am I saying? I'm saying it's possible. And unless we take heed, brethren, it's possible for me. If it, if it could happen to them, I'm promising you, it could happen to anybody. But by the grace of God, they're going. So take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But verse 13, but exhort one another daily. Hey, listen, why do we need to come to church? Why do we need to stay in touch with one another? Why, why, do we, why is this important? Because... W- I don't, none of you want to depart. I mean, you wouldn't say you did now, but it's happened to others. But we need to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hey, sin is deceitful. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You remember we, we read that passage about wolves in sheep's clothing? You'll know them by their fruit, but... It might be a while before you see the fruit growing. So who's the wolves? We need to exhort one another while it's today and while we have opportunity. Because of this deceitfulness of sin. One more passage I want to read to you tonight before we close, and that's Luke 12, 37 and 38. And it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Listen, our testimony needs to be a contrasting testimony. It needs to be a a Christ-like testimony, and it needs to be a continuing testimony. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get tired. And getting tired, it happens. But what we can't do is give up or sit down. We got to just keep chugging along putting one foot in front of the other, getting her done. Because Jesus is coming. And I want him to find me serving him. No matter what hour of the day or night he comes. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want him finding me doing certain things. I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing when he shows up. Whether I'm here preaching or preparing to preach, doesn't matter to me long as he doesn't find me doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. 
Because then, listen, Nathan, uh, uh, Dathan and all his buddies, their testimony lasted. When, when, man, when, when Jesus finds you, when, it's, when he comes for you, your testimony is finished. It becomes fixed in stone for all eternity, and you can't change it anymore. So I want to make sure my testimony is hitting the mark all the way to the last day. Let's stand together tonight. Let's stand together. Listen, we need God's help. It's, we're, we're living in tough times. It's perilous times. But our testimony is so important right now. Somebody, and you may not even know who it is, somebody is looking at you. What they need to see is Jesus. They need to see a Christian testimony. Father, I want to thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for being so long-suffering and patient with us. Father, this thing of the testimony is so important, especially in these perilous times. I pray that you'd help us and give us strength and boldness and a zeal to continue to be Christ-like, to be contrasting, to be different than the world. Not just a little different, night and day different from who we were and who the world is. Others might call us weird. Long as I'm Christ-like, I don't care what they call me. We ask for your help and we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 277 in a song.